All right, I'd also like to begin by echoing the appreciation um, of my colleagues, both for all of the work that Rebecca put into bringing us all together, and just to say it's been an absolute pleasure so far to, to listen to all of your papers, to see the performances, and to have the conversations that we've had so far. So thank you all. This paper is a series of discrete thoughts, ordered because of necessity, though I'm not certain that I have the order right. There are three of them. One, a story about ostriches and cell phones. <laughs> one, a strategy for cultivating invisibility. And one, a meditation on metaphor. In my head, they go together somehow, even if I don't get the articulation quite right. In my head, the going togetherness doesn't depend on right articulation. Something else is at stake. I think it's a question of how to think backwards. What Artaud called active metaphysics, or more poignantly, a form of thought that insults itself, thus collapsing the stage between rhetoric and performance. What's important, though, is that it's not a metaphor for something else. A metaphor always already is something else. That's why it's insulting to a system of meaning. That's also why it's interesting to the project of speculation. I want to argue that metaphor is a linguistic incantation that holds the potential to collapse the conceit of rational articulation. And I want to argue that its method is one of invisibility, doubling terms and thus hiding through excess the possibility of singular identity. I think we desperately need nonlinear ways of thinking, and the easiest solution is simply to double thought, what metaphor does by nature. Story number one, transactional attention. I close my eyes. Can you still see me? There's a common myth that ostriches bury their heads in the sand when confronted with danger. As the story goes, they do this because it is thought. They think that if they cannot see a predator, then the predator also cannot see them. The story is not actually true. Ostriches have better survival instincts than this, and being fast runners, they tend to run from predators with very good success. The story, however, derives from the fact that ostriches cannot fly and thus have to bury their eggs and thus have to dig holes and use their heads to turn the eggs for uniform incubation. So there is what Hermann called a kind of hard knowledge to back up the claim that the ostrich myth is untrue. However, it's still a nice myth if such a thing can be permitted, and if such a permission can be used to keep alive the possibility that sticking one's head in the sand might be an interesting way to change visual and possibly even social experiences of the, experiences of the world. In some ways, it's great that it's not true about ostriches, that way, they shouldn't be offended if we want to try it ourselves. <laughs> also worth noting, however, that the, while the head in the sand myth is technically untrue for ostriches, and perhaps yet to be proven for us, what ostriches do do sometimes is lay their heads down on the sand in order to camouflage their appearances. Their heads and necks are the color of sand, blending into the ground where the, while their darker bellies take on a bush-like shape when no head is immediately uh, apparent sticking up. It's a more legible form of invisibility, one based on camouflage and disappearing into one's surroundings, misdirection, and appearing like other things that could be there instead of you. Invisibility achieved through the managing of appearances rather than by an act of disappearance proper, a strategic insult to appearances. There's another story told by David Giacchetto in an essay on distributed agency about how pedestrians who are looking at their phones are more likely to be hit by cars. It's not, as one would normally assume, that they are hit because they are not paying attention and thus unable to jump out of the way, though that happens too. Instead, this particular story focuses on the ways that drivers themselves become less aware of pedestrians that are less aware of them, literally. In a certain mode of thought, it makes sense. It's a form of what I would call transactional attention. It's also a form of a psychological condition called inattentional blindness. Um, and it, uh, that has been observed that when uh, that focused vision comes at the expense of environmental attentiveness. That is, paying attention to one thing causes us to neglect other things. And the same is true for sound, like when someone is so immersed in a video game that they literally don't hear you asking them a question. Inattentional deafness. In both cases, though, this phenomenon does not quite involve exclusion or disappearance proper, but an active cognitive process of redirection, or better, a process of already redirected thought. But think about that. If tricks of magic in mind rely on misdirection, to become attentive to modes of thought that have redirection already built in seems important. Preemptive redirection, no magic required. 
Instead, what one does is create a situation or simply engage such that a situation becomes subsuming to the point where it produces an inattentional, inv inattentional invisibility in whatever form the medium of engagement makes possible. Number two, hiding in ectoplasm. Close your eyes. Can you still see me? There are more esoteric strategies for developing the skill of invisibility. I'm mostly interested in the most material of them, those that demand process rather than strategy, that offer ways to literally disappear, to actually materialize the promise of burying heads in the sand, to afford agency to the project of appearances. One such possibility comes from a New Age author who frames himself as a former military intelligence operative with special insight into paranormal and occult practices. He publishes under the name Commander X. The, the book I discovered is a how-to manual called Invisibility and Levitation, How-To Keys for Personal Performance, with per personal performance, which outlines a series of procedures that Commander X um, suggests for learning how to be invisible. I want to share them in some detail because I think the process depends a lot on the techniques of the actions the procedures ask us to learn and to perform. Specifically, what I'm interested in is the idea that there could be a techniques to invisibility. And that unless we are in a position to have given it a good go without success, we might not actually be in a position to judge the efficacy or inefficacy of the teachings. For Commander X, invisibility is a four-step process. First, one needs to learn to see the aura, by which he means the energy presence of the body, commonly known in spiritualist circles but doubted by many. He is a process for cultivating this sense of vision. It involves spending time in a dark room, watching how darkness takes form between moving hands. As a photographer trained to work both with light and in dark rooms, there's something familiar about his suggestion, that while in the dark, there are certain things that one still feels, and that this sense of feeling might, even if synesthetically, constitute a sort of seeing. I take his method as a way to cultivate this form of darkened vision. Second, one needs to learn how to manipulate this feeling, initiated first by establishing the link between the aura one sees in the dark and the feeling that is this new way one sees it. In the dark, one does not see. That, one's, that one nevertheless sees means that the relationship to appearances is different. For Commander X, this difference suggests other possible modes of engagement, one of which is interaction. And that one feels rather than sees is important. It means the tactility of the situation can be worked on, intensified, built up, until what one feels metaphorically is felt with literal hands, Aura begins the process of materialization. At this point, it begins to become ectoplasm. Third, when this process of materialization begins, Commander X prescribes a process of spinning, turning the feeling of ectoplasmic manifestation around and around like one might spin cotton candy into edible form. Only this time it's not for eating, but with the intention of creating a mist or a fog that can grow to envelop the body. And that's the fourth step stepping into the ectoplasmic cloud in order to thus become invisible, not by disappearing, but by stepping into a cloud made by the power of the mind and the manifest imaginary. It makes me wonder whether Chiquetto's cell phones or the ostrich myths might be seen as generators of ectoplasmic clouds. We know they enable digital clouds, heads in the cloud, so to speak, but what if heads in the cloud were not just a metaphor, but an actual ectoplasmic conflation? Number three bananas. Close your eyes. Where did you go? The whole point of talking about the interstices between sound and the occult for me is to collapse the idea that the occult is metaphoric, or at least to collapse the idea that metaphor is metaphoric, by which I mean some form of implied rhetorical distance between language and its manifestation. That is, while I love metaf metaphor, I refuse, it, I refuse to give it privileged status as a literary tactic and really want to think through the ways that doubled thinking can actually serve to doubly matter rather than construct zones of aesthetic consideration that sit at a safe distance from those things we call real, whatever that might be. I think of matter in terms of Johnny Golding's notion of radical mattering, a making material of relationships often dismissed as rhetorical, personal, imaginary, or otherwise. For in many ways, the occult is the opposite of metaphor. Even though its operations can look similar from the outside, and especially so when metaphor is seen as a literary mode rather than one with ontological potentiality. In the occult, or at least the version of the occult that I'm interested in, what seems to present itself as ritualized or symbolic actually is about manifestation. 
and there can thus be nothing more literal, despite the fact that the occult seems devoted to things that don't properly exist, or perhaps better put, things that don't exist in proper ways, improper manifestations, or the materiality of metaphor. Like when Northrop Fry says that, that poetry is a child's first language, after which the process of acquiring skills of rational and technical uh, articulation. Or when Picasso said he spent his whole life learning to draw like a child. There's something romantic about it, of course. But I have a son who's one and a half, and he doesn't yet articulate with linguistic specificity. Well, he's learning, but I find that there's something tragic about that act of learning. Learning names, orders, differences, linearity and something beautiful about that stage of cognitive multiplicity when a car is also a truck or a bus, when a dog is anything with four legs that moves, when an apple is anything round that seems like it can be eaten, and a rock anything round that seems like it can't. It's deeply metaphoric, in the most literal of multi-speak ways. One thing is another, literally. It is multi-dimensional. A grape is an apple, a ball is a rock, a squirrel is a cow, is a cat, is a kangaroo, is a dinosaur. The most virtuosic metaphor would probably be one single word that meant everything. I don't have virtuosic aspirations myself, so I don't, I don't have any stake in trying to guess what that word might be. But my son's first word was bananas. <laughs> but isn't this also then about the ways that linguistic incantation collapses the conceit of rational articulation? And the way that invisibility, while failing to participate or refusing to participate in an economy of appearances, nevertheless or tends a, sensi a sensitivity to the environments with which one engages. Just to conclude then, those of you who know me know that I talk around things. I, don't, I dislike direct address, and I prefer to retain the ambiguities of situations and concepts by refusing to exhaustively render an argument. I hope this series of thoughts hits that note. Maybe it's a wolf tone of thought. That doesn't, <laughs> one that doesn't really aspire to saying too much too directly, but instead to speculate, meditate, and advocate for the serious contemplation of things that don't immediately seem serious or important, like ostriches, or invisibility, or metaphor. Thanks. Yeah.